Welcome to Operating Systems Lecture 23. Right. So last time we were talking about locking, and uh, we took this example, this hypothetical example of uh, of a bank with many accounts, and uh, with functionality like transfer uh, and sum. And we said that look, uh, coarse grain locking can solve all the concurrency problems, but coarse grain locking is not good because uh, it serializes everything, right? So because it, it ensures that everything is mutually exclusive, it basically causes everything to get serialized. So even if there are multiple processors, only one transfer function will be able to execute any time if you are using coarse grain locking. So, so then we said, okay, you know, we should use fine grain locking. And the question was, how should you how should you decide how to use fine grain locking? So this choice of how to choose where to use fine grain locking is a bit of an art. So there's no, so I mean, it's basically something that the programmer has to decide. Based on uh, based on what he feels is the right way of doing things, right? So there is no there is no uh, there is no one rule or uh, to say that this is how you should fine grain lock in, in this program or that program. Depending on the program, you would want to choose your fine grain locks differently. So for example, uh, you know, yesterday we said that uh, every account should have uh, uh, a lock, so there should be a per account lock, and any operation that require, require requires access to multiple accounts, you should take all the locks. Before doing that uh, operation, so all the locks for uh, all the locks for all the accounts that are touched in that operation. So transfer operation touched two lock uh, two accounts. You are going to take two locks. Uh, the sum operation touched all accounts. You are going to take all locks, right? Uh, and uh, we also said that one one way to take the locks is to take it in an on-demand way. When I say I, I, I take it in an on-demand way, it doesn't mean that I release the previous locks, right? Because this operation is basically an operation that needs to be atomic. We need to take all the locks at some point in time, anyways. It's just that you can say that you know I'll take the account, uh, lock for the first account, then do some computation, then I'll take the lock for the second account without releasing the account for, uh, lock for the first account, and so on, right? Uh, so you could do that, but uh, we also saw that the locks have to be in a certain order to avoid deadlocks, right? And so the ordering uh, the, and the ordering has to be global. Once again, uh, you know the programmer has to figure out what the order has to be. And uh, and the order will may be tied to your data structure. It may be tied to the semantics of your program. For example, the last time we we decided that we we're going to order it on the account ID of the account, and uh, based on that, we'll take a priori all the locks uh, needed for transfer. We'll take two locks for some. We'll take all the locks, do our atomic operation, and then release all the locks. Right. So um, so so that was the uh, that was a hypothetical example, of course. Let's uh, let's look at another example. Let's say I have a file system. So as you know, as an operating system, one of the services that an operating system provides you is a file system. What is a file system? A file system is an on-disk data structure, right? So a disk is nothing but a, a raw magnetic device which has lots of blocks, and a file system is a data structure built on top of this uh, sort of storage, uh, which allow and uh, and the semantics of the file system are usually a file system is hierarchical. So you have a root directory, and then you have some names, and each name uh, may be a file or a, another directory, and so on. And so you basically build a directory tree, and that's basically what uh, what a file system is. Now you can imagine that there are multiple processes running in the system. Multiple processes are making multiple system calls concurrently. So one is calling read, another calling write on different files, on same files. All these are possibilities. So question is, the the operating system needs to Synchronize or make sure that operation accesses to the file system are correctly, uh, you know, are correctly done, uh, and uh, basically, uh, you know, it basically means that uh, operations should be atomic. So if there's uh, there's an operation going on here and an operation going on there, they shouldn't appear interleaved uh, at any point because interleaving of those operations can cause bad things in your file system. All right. So you know, one option is once again coarse grain locking. Put a lock on the entire file system. You're safe. Definitely safe. Right. But of course, that's not a very good solution. You can imagine that your system will run at very, very slow speed. You know, nobody will be able to access the uh, file system concurrently. Only one person will be able to access the file system at the time. So what do you do? Once again, choosing what locks to take is a bit of an art. You may say, let's have uh, a lock per directory. Or you may say, let's have a lock per file. Or, uh, or you may say, let's have a lock per, you know, just hy hy very hypothetically, Let's have a lock per pair of files. You know, if you figure out that most of the operations are actually occurring on pair of files, so why not you know have a lock instantiation per pair of files? And if you're going to uh, you know do an operation between those those two files, 
or something. But you know, when in that case, if you're going to touch one file, then you have to take all the locks in uh, which uh, uh, for that file where that file belongs to a pair. So if you know for all the pairs for that file, you need to take a lock. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. So yes, I mean, uh, you know, intuitively it seems like the best thing to do is basically take a file per lock, a lock per file. All right. So 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 what I'm going to show you is basically, you know, if you do this kind of fine grained locking, uh, it it hurts your program structure. So the program structure is not does not the modularity in your program actually reduces because of this uh, because of this locking behavior. So let's say uh, because of fine grained locking basically. So let's say I have a function which uh, which looks like this. It says move. Uh, so it's just moving a file from one directory to another directory. So it says move uh, this file name called old name from old directory and put it as new name in new directory. Right. So it, so that's the semantics of this function. And what it does is it basically looks up uh, looks up the disk block. So let's say i number is a disk block or uh, or some identifier which is uh, identifying the number at which this uh, file is stored. It just looks up the the old name in old directory. Delete, deletes old name from old directory and adds new name to new directory at that i number that you looked up, right? And so this code is correct. Let's say when, uh, when you're run, running serially, when there's only one thread that's accessing it, this code is also correct if you're having one big glo global lock that's protecting this entire function. But let's say I have per file locks, right? So, so or per directory locks. So let's say I have per directory locks, and uh, so what do I need to do? I am accessing. Um, I'm accessing uh, the old directory, uh, reading and writing the old directory here. So I need to have uh, I need to lock this region with the uh, with the old directory's lock, and I'm adding something to new directory. So I need to lock this region with the new directory's lock. But can I do these in isolation? Well, no, because uh, you know I want perhaps I want my move operation to be atomic, right? Uh, if I if I just say that oh let let you know let uh, di uh, directory delete, do the locking inside it. And I don't care about uh, you know what locking it does inside, and then let direct directly add do the locking inside it, and uh, I don't care. Then what happens is at this point here, no locks are held, and anybody is free to observe these directories or the state of these directories. And at this point, what you're going to find is that this file doesn't exist anywhere, right? And so this, the file system is in, in an inconsistent state at this point. Uh, you know, uh, so there there is some there are some disk blocks that don't uh, that are not pointed to by anybody, N neither by the old directory nor nor by the new directory, and that's an inconsistent state, right? In other words, you know, if you do it, do it in that way, the move operation is not atomic, right? So what you would what would you want? You would again want to do basically uh, something like this. You would say acquire old del dot lock. And acquire new del dot lock, right? And then you will do this operation, and then you will just release these locks. So what has happened is basically because of fine-grained locking, any function that is that is building upon these. Uh, so earlier, it was very modular. You know, a move function could have been written in three lines, and without having to worry about what these functions are doing inside, whether these functions have to take a lock, not take a lock. That's not my business. I just call these functions. But now, because I'm doing fine-grained locking, now it is my business to know what locks are they going to take, right? And in fact, instead of asking them to take them, I'll need to take them on their behalf, and I'll need to take them in a certain order, right? So in other words, basically, what I'm saying is locks. And modularity are sort of uh, you know uh, so locks basically hamper modularity, right? So locks are not uh, not very friendly to modularity. They sort of make your code more complex, less modular, right? Earlier you could just say that this function is going to do delete, this function is going to do add. I don't care what it does internally, but now you have to worry about oh this function is actually going to need to take a lock, and this function is going to need to take a lock, and uh, and because I need to do this atomically instead of them taking a lock, let me take a lock on behalf of them, and now because I'm taking a lock, they shouldn't be taking a lock, and so on, right? So the, the entire semantics of your function has become complicated. The semantics are not just that this function this function is going to delete a uh, name from the directory. The semantics now need to be this function is going to delete a name from the directory and it should not. It should assume that a lock has already been taken, and it should not be taking a lock itself, right? So, so I mean, uh, locking and fine-grained locking, especially, sort of complicates things. Um, 
all right so so let's uh, let's look at locks uh, and locks implementations in a little more depth all right so we we'll, uh, we said that uh, how are locks implemented you know one of those uh, one of the one of the ways we implemented locks uh, in a couple of lectures back was a spin lock and where we said that uh, there's a function called acquire right and uh, let's just take struct lock star l let's say and it just says while um, and let's say this there's a function which is internally calling the exchange instruction so i'm calling the exchange instruction and uh, so you know one way to do this is let's say there's a register which i put a value 1 into and then i say while exchange register address of the logged field in l is equal to 1 i keep spinning otherwise i return right so you know just uh, just read this code once more uh, basically what i'm doing is uh, i'm basically trying to put the value 1 into the logged field of this l right so i'm basically want i want to put a, a value 1 into the logged field of the uh, l variable except that i want to make sure that earlier it was zero Right. If it was earlier one, then I should be just waiting for it to become zero, right? So that's basically acquire. That's the semantics of acquire, and here's how I'm implementing it. And we've seen it before. Uh, so I put the one value in R, and uh, this this function is going to atomically swap R and this memory location L dot locked, right? And so uh, if L dot locked was zero, R is going to become zero, and so you're going to come out of the loop. But if L dot log was one, then R is going to remain one, and you're going to retry, uh, making it, uh, you know, retry it till you see a zero value in locked, right? Right? And we also talked about uh, last time why this implementation is an atomic, or you know, it works because if two instruct two threads try to call exchange simultaneously, one of them will occur before the other. They cannot get interleaved. So the swapping operation is atomic, <laughs> basically, right? So everybody remembers this, right? Okay. All right, so let's see what happens at the hardware level when you execute something like this. All right, and just for completeness, let me just also write release. Release is just uh, L dot locked is equal to zero. Yeah, okay. Okay, all right, so let's see what's happening at the hardware level. So mm -hmm. let's say here's my bus, right? So we have seen this diagram before. I basically always draw a bus here and I say that here's my CPU right and let's say this is CPU 0 and this is CPU 1 right and let's say this is memory okay and inside the memory there is this uh, variable called L dot lock. And in the CPU zero, there are private registers R's, right? And what, I'm, what each, th let's say both the threads are executing simultaneously on CPU zero and CPU one. This thread is going to set it to one. This thread is going to set it to one. Both are going to say exchange. One of them is going to win. Whoever wins gets the lock. The other one just spins, right? That's what's, uh, that's the idea. Typically, you have, you must have studied in your uh, operating system class, or in your uh, computer architecture class that Every CPU also has a cache, right? So let me just say cache. So my first question is, when I call the exchange instruction, is it OK to just exchange from within the cache? So L dot logged is just another memory location, right? And so when you access it, it just comes into the cache. And uh, can the exchange instruction just you know, do the local operation without having to go to on, on the disk, on the bus? No, because, you know, because, L, because the exchange operation is an atomic operation, and, they need, and there needs to be serialization between who is doing that. Uh, you know, so there has to be some communication on the bus. Either the communication has to be directly with the main memory, or they have to talk with each other to basically make sure that you know, there is serialization. Either he wins or he wins, right? So one of them is going to get zero, and the other one is going to get the answer one. Both of them cannot get the answer zero, basically. And so there has to be some bus protocol here that has to happen here. And so 
each exchange instruction will require some bus transaction, right? In general, memory accesses don't necessarily require bus transaction, right? Whenever I read or write a value, if the value is found in the cache, I can just uh, locally satisfy it from the cache. It's only when there's a cache miss do I need to go to the memory, right? And typically, you know, these, pro uh, these processors have what's called a cache coherence protocol. Uh, so the idea is that let's say I access the memory location A and it gets cached here and then this CPU accesses the memory location A then you know there is some protocol that's going on here which will invalidate this uh, location and then validate and then bring it here right so you know if these both these CPUs are accessing the same location then there will be some uh, bus transactions that are shuttling this uh, variable between these two right in any case you know when we are doing this exchange uh, business then uh, the problem is that there is there is a lot of bus traffic basically going on you know if there are two cpus there are a certain amount of bus traffic if there are uh, four cpus there are bo there's more if there are eight cpus there's even more if there are 64 then you know basically bus is definitely the bottleneck yeah. there's a question uh, sir, is this protocol only for the exchange operation or is it for every so cache coherence protocol is for every memory access all right so for every memory access clearly i mean you cannot have so the hardware ensures that you know there is some sort of, uh, so there's, that's what coherence means. So there's coherence in accesses. It cannot be that the same location has two, two values, basically, at the same time. So for every memory access, the cache coherence protocol works. It need not work. So if, if the same CPU accesses the same location 10 times, it's only the first time that there will be a bus transaction. The next nine times, it will get satisfied from the local cache without any bus transaction, without any cache coherence protocol getting having to kick in because assuming that this other CPU is not accessing that location, that location is locally satisfied from the cache, all right? But if you are uh, executing the exchange instruction each time, then you have to make a bus transaction because it has to be atomic with respect to everything else, right? So, um, so, so in, our, in, in the code here, let's say if there are, uh, you know, if there are, if there are four, two processors, one of the processors gets the lock the other processor just keeps calling exchange and the exchange all each exchange execution exchange is causing a bus transaction and so there's a lot of bus traffic okay so this is not not the best possible implementation of a spin lock and uh, and how can you make it better well one way to make it better is for example put another loop here which is not using an atomic exchange uh, exchange operation which is just checking So exchange instruction is a more cost, is costly ex operation because you know it needs atomicity. On the other hand, uh, this operation is just a read operation. A read operation is a less costly operation. It doesn't need atomicity, right? And so what I'm doing is I'm basically, uh, you know, in, instead of every time calling the expensive operation, what I'm basically doing is I'm, I, want to, I'm wait, I want to wait for logged to become zero, right? And so Instead of doing it, in, but I'm doing, I also need the exchange instruction because I want to sort of swap it atomically. So the checking code can be, uh, can be done through just reading. And then once, you, once the read says, yes, it has become zero, then you can retry the exchange operation. It's not necessary the exchange operation will f uh, succeed, but it's a high likelihood that it will succeed this time, right? If it doesn't succeed, no problem. You again come back here and you again wait for it to become zero, right? So what will happen in this case, let's say, uh, you know, both CPUs try to do exchange. One of them wins. The other one just calls the loop. And this time, that, uh, the inner loop is going to sa get satisfied from the cache. Right? So the inner loop is going to get satisfied from the cache. You have reduced the bus traffic. OK? All right. All right. So, so this is all good. But let's see what happens if you write code like this you know, without having to, uh, you know, let's say you write this code in C. You just say uh, while exchange, and then in the inner loop is while locked. You know, a comp uh, if you, uh, you know a compiler is basically uh, looks at these variables and decides which of these variables to register allocate and which of these variables to uh, keep in memory, right? So what happens if this variable becomes register allocated? Right? So uh, I hope uh, people understand what is register allocation of a variable. Studied in the programming languages class or Right? So basically, the idea is, let's say, um, 
let's say there is a variable called a and say a is equal to 1 you know b is equal to a plus 2 and c is equal to 2 3 into a or whatever and so the question is one way to deal with a is basically say that keep it in memory and each of these operations are memory accesses and this other way is basically read a into a register so let's say there's a load instruction and you read a into a register and then you op perform all these operations on uh, on r so you say you know r plus 2 is equal to b and c is equal to 3 into r and let's say you also say a plus plus so you say r plus plus and then later on you can say store r to a right so this is uh, this is a common optimization a very uh, the most basic optimization of a compiler that if there is a memory is a variable instead of so variables are basically you know have a one to one relation with the memory location but if there are multiple access to a variable and the program and the compiler can see that there are multiple access to a variable the optimization is that you just bring the variable from memory into a register do those accesses to the register instead of the memory so you have saved some memory accesses and then after you have computed the thing you just save it back into the into the memory right common uh, common optimization of a compiler similarly in this code this variable l dot logged a compiler is free to register allocate so what can happen if the variable gets register allocated it's an infinite loop right it will never finish so you know with the best of the intentions compilers are not really you know playing well with the, what the operating system uh, designer really wants and so uh, you know either either the operating system designer writes this loop in assembly or actually the compilers give you special keywords to basically say oh don't optimize this variable all right so there's a for example on c there is a variable called uh, there's a keyword called volatile so if you declare a variable where, you know or a field with a volatile struct uh, or with a volatile type then basically the compiler says oh this is something that you know the programmer has really written very carefully i shouldn't be optimizing it at all all right so you know just an interesting example of how uh, you know how a compiler writer so a compiler writer does not worry about concurrency and does not need does not understand which one is what is a lock and what's not a lock etc he's just looking at code and he's just uh, you know optimizing it but um, you know if you're writing the special code like this you should basically basically declare things as volatile and this is one of the reasons why you know it's right difficult to uh, difficult to uh, get concurrent programs correct notice that you know it's easy to basically say that acquire fun write this acquire function very carefully and then use this acquire function to mark critical sections but on the other hand if i didn't want to use locks and i just wanted to very carefully write this sort of code then i have to worry about oh the compiler shouldn't optimize it and uh, you know other things like that and so that's a very hard thing to reason about in general all right um, the other thing a compiler and even the hardware does is reordering right so if um, if i basically have uh, an instruction that says a is equal to 1 and then i say b is equal to 2 a compiler is free to reorder these instructions right for a compiler these are completely different memory accesses completely different variables it doesn't matter which occurs first right on the other hand if you look at our locking code you know reordering is fatal for our for our logic you know because if we are writing to the locked field and then we are accessing some shared variable if the compiler reorders these things then you know the critical section is outside the lock or before the lock and bad things can happen right so uh, similarly it's possible that the release the, so the sh the, uh, the an access in the critical section is reordered after the release right so for example um, in this um, in this case l dot log is equal to 0 before this i had a shared variable access you know these two com are completely independent memory accesses and uh, you know a compiler may say oh let's just reorder these things it's not just the compiler who can do this it's actually even the hardware that can do this right so uh, most so modern hardware basically do out of order memory accesses right even the intel ar architecture and the most of the performance they get are basically because of out of order memory accesses and the reason you need to do out of order memory accesses is because some memory accesses are going to take a long time and others are going to take a short time because some memory accesses may be cache hits and others may be cache misses so whatever is a cache hit you know let's just do that first and what is the cache miss you know let let it come whenever it when it's ready right so even the hard even if the compiler played well with you the hardware can actually reorder accesses so it's possible that the logged 
access log variable was in cache and just sort of got you know get got set first and later on the other critical shared variables getting set so once again you have to be very careful in doing this and um, and so you know modern processors provide um, what are called fences right so we basically put a fence and the fence is basically saying that all memory accesses before the fence should have finished before any memory access of the after the fence starts okay so so the idea you know from a hardware designer standpoint is that in general let's allow reordering of memory accesses re reordering of unrelated memory accesses of course which seem unrelated at least but a programmer has a way of saying that okay here's a memory access and here's a memory access so in this case if i want to disallow this so let's say i want to say that this is this should not be possible then i'll put a fence in the middle so that's a, you know so there are multiple ways of fitting a fence it's very architecture specific you, you know you have special instructions which you can say that you know has a fence there's a fence instruction so you can put a fence instruction so that way this will will get disallowed or there are special instructions like the exchange instruction itself acts as a fence right so some instructions will never allow reord ordering of uh, across the, themselves all right okay good now uh, all right so so let's look at this um, this uh, implementation again so what i'm saying is that the exchange instruction itself is acting as a fence in the case of acquire and in the case of release the programmer should put a fence in some way or the other right either a fence instruction or instead of using a simple write you use some exchange instruction to do the write for example all right okay now let's say uh, so this is a spin lock right and uh, let's say i am an operating system developer and uh, um i basically also get interrupts right so these spin locks will protect against uh, multiple uh, concurrent accesses by multiple cpus but if i am within let's say i'm uh, i'm within an, within a critical section and an interrupt comes the interrupt handler will get to run and if the interrupt handler also needs the same lock then there are problems right you can either end up with a deadlock or uh, yeah so if 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 you're doing it like this then if if i am within a critical section and uh, and uh, i'm holding a lock and it's possible that the interrupt handler also wants to get the same lock then i'll have a deadlock right so and you know the mo the the most co the core of the operating system typically has such code for example there's a lock to protect the process table p table in x86 for example so that lock is you know is being accessed by multiple functions and even the interrupt handler or the timer interrupt handler is going to need to access this p table lock right and is going to need to access the p table and is going to need to acquire the p table lock so such locks uh, are you know are even more special and so what you do is uh, in that case you basically make sure that not only do you uh, just do this you also disable interrupts in your acquire and you re-enable interrupts in release right uh, so so you you know when you acquire a lock any lock if you know that this, uh, the uh, these locks can be acquired by or can be requested by interrupt handlers you also disable the interrupt so within the critical section an interrupt is not possible anymore right it's only when you really uh, you quit the critical section will an interrupt get get in the way and uh, yeah so you know on xv6 you will find a function called instead of just cli and sty you will find push cli and uh, instead of sty you will find pop cli and the idea here is that it's possible that uh, you know you you are trying to acquire multiple locks so let's say you acquire p table lock first and then you acquire file system lock second and uh, both of them wanted to you know both of them need to do cli but then let's say you release one of the locks then you don't want to immediately do sty so basically you have some kind of recursion so each cpu so there's a cpu pointer dot so there's a there's a cpu dot n cli variable and so push cli just does uh, cpu dot n cli plus plus and if cpu dot n cli is equal to 1 then you actually call cli right which means you just transition from 0 to 1 so you actually need to disable interrupts and similarly pop cli so that's push cli roughly speaking and that's prop cli so pop cli is basically uh, cpu 
point around n cli minus minus and if c p u dot n cli is equal to 0 then sty right yeah question Right, right. So uh, clearly, I'm talking about within the operating system where the interrupt handler can require, would need to acquire the same lock that you are holding. Right. Only in that case do you need to disable the interrupts. And I, I'm really talking about the the real inner core of the kernel. Okay. Uh, clearly, so um, so so you know so so for example, when you see implementation of the spin lock in the XP6 kernel. And that spin lock is basically used for your p table lock and uh, and other, among other things you will basically find that the acquire function not just does the exchange to protect against other cpus it also does a cli to protect against interrupt handlers okay so you need to do both these things all right okay um, so and also this n cli variable is a cpu private variable right so you uh, there are ways to say that this variable is only going to be accessed by this CPU, and so no other CPU can uh, will ever be able to access that variable. Or you can just have an array with, you know, pers uh, where each element is accessed by only the corresponding CPU and nobody else. So that's a per, per, per CPU variable. Okay. All right. So so let's say. I'm in the user mode. Okay, so I've talked about kernel mode, but let's say I'm in the user mode, and I want to do, uh, I want to implement my, let's say, banking application, and uh, and I want to implement locks. So, what kind of locks should I use? Well, uh, firstly, the question could be, uh, you know, whether I'm running on a multiprocessor or a uniprocessor, uh, or in fact, even before that, the question should be whether you want to implement a spin lock or a blocking lock, right? So if you want to uh, do a spin lock, do you need any kernel involvement? Unless you want to disable interrupts. Would a user uh, level lock need to disable interrupts? I said you need to disable interrupts only if that lock could be requested by an interrupt handler. I mean, assuming that the user level locks are just private to the user and the kernel has nothing to do with it, then the interrupt handler has nothing to do with that lock, right? So you will not need to disable any interrupts for a user level lock. Okay. So can you do implement a spin lock without having any kernel involvement? The answer is yes. Okay. All you need to do is declare a variable and use the exchange instruction. Exchange instruction is an unprivileged instruction. Right? It just has the semantics that things will be atomic. That's all. Right? So the same code that I showed you, this one, without the without the cli, implements a spin lock in user mode. Okay. So a spin lock in user mode is as fast as a spin lock in kernel mode. You just basically, you know, try to atomically set it to one, and if not, you just spin, just in exactly in the same way. And hopefully your critical section was small, and you will immediately get the lock. All right. Um, does it matter whether you are using uh, kernel level threads or user level threads? Because user level threads will only run on a single CPU, you don't even need to do this exchange business, right? Uh, uh, user level threads will only run on a single CPU and so instead of using a spin lock you would probably want to use a blocking lock instead right and of course so blocking locks will be used either if you are using user level threads or if you are you're sure that you know your threads are not going are going to run on a single CPU for, for whatever other reason there could be and uh, and if your critical sections are known to be very large right for example if you're making a system call while holding that lock you might as well just you know uh, use a blocking lock rather than using a spin lock Right? So in all these cases, you will not use a spin lock, you will use a blocking lock. Do you need kernel involvement to do blocking locks, to implement blocking locks? Yes. yes, because a blocking lock basically needs to tell the kernel to change my state from ready or running to blocked. Right? And so I need, and the, only, the user has no way of changing it from ready to blocked. And so it has to tell the kernel to do it. Right? So there has to be a kernel interaction. 
unless, of course, you were using user level threads, in which case the kernel has no idea. And so you're, in that case, your user level scheduler is just going to, is just uh, changing the state of your, uh, you know, currently running thread to, uh, to uh, from ready to block. So in that case, your P table is maintained at the user level. So in either case, the P table, the state in the P table needs to be changed from ready to blocked. If you're, you're running kernel level threads, you need kernel interaction to do that. If you're running user level threads, you can just do that locally in the user. All right. So let's see how blocking locks are implemented. All right. So you can imagine that there is a p table, right? Or you know, I'm using a, a, an array, but you could even have a list of uh, PCBs or any such data structure that's maintaining all your process PCBs, process control blocks, right? And uh, what you're going to do is, let's say somebody says lock, and he's not able to get the lock, then uh, you will basically uh, want to change its state. So let's say this is a process, and this is currently running. Then, uh, and it calls acquire. You would want to change its state to blocked. Right? And you would want to record that uh, it's blocked on whatever was the argument of L, uh, acquire. So let's say blocked on L, right? And then if somebody calls some, some other process, so this becomes blocked, so this never gets to run in future, till somebody calls release. So let's say here's the process that was running, and then it calls release L. And what release is going to do is it's going to go over the P table, Right, and uh, pick up one process that is blocked on L. Right, so this from here, this here the Ls are matched, and change it from blocked to running, or ready, not running but ready. Right? So it will change it from blocked to ready. Right, so that's how blocking locks will be implemented. Okay, all right. So but this p table structure itself it needs to be protected. You know, access to the p table uh, structure itself by multiple threads needs to be protected so you will use a spin lock to protect the p table and then and so blocking lock internally will use a spin lock to protect this structure and uh, to switch from running between running and blocked these different entries right so there will be a p table dot lock let's say which will be a spin lock Well, I mean, will the p table dot lock only be needed for a multiprocessor? Well, you know, so on a uniprocessor, a p table dot lock uh, equates to a cli, you know, clear interrupts. So basically, you want that while you are in the middle of accessing the p table, nobody else should basically interrupt you, right? So uh, on a multiprocessor, you will use a spin lock. On a uniprocessor, you could do that just by disabling interrupts. All right. Basically, what you want is mutual exclusion while you're accessing the p table, right? And mutual exclusion on a multiprocessor only way is spin locks. Mutual exclusion on a uniprocessor the way is disabling interrupts. Okay. All right. Um, okay. All right. Okay. Now let me talk about some locking variations. Yes. All right. So there is something called a recursive lock. So uh, you may have seen that sometimes we run into this situation where you acquire a lock and then you call some other function and that wants to acquire the same lock. And at that point, we deadlock, right? Because the same thread cannot acquire the same lock multiple times. So uh, you know the recursive lock. Basically, what it does it it allows the same thread to acquire a lock multiple times. All right, and the semantics of a Of a recursive lock are fairly simple. 
let us say this is recursive lock, let us say this is recursive acquire L. Uh, you will say if L dot owner, so you will keep something called an owner is equal to current thread, then L dot count plus plus all right else else you call the regular acquire all right and uh, you set l dot count to 0 and l dot owner to curt thread okay. so basically the idea is you know a lock is supposed to provide mutual exclusion between multiple threads if for some reason the programmer feels that you know or for modularity or whatever reason if he feels that the same thread wants to acquire the same lock multiple times let us allow that right. So, that is the that is the that is the spirit behind the recursive lock and of course, recursive release will just basically decrement count and only if count becomes 0 does it release the lock right. So, that is what release me does. So, should I write release? So, let us say let, let me also write release. I will just say L dot count minus minus if L dot count is equal to 0 then release L dot lock right ok something like this right. So, this is a recursive lock sounds like a good idea or a bad idea no idea. Okay, all right. So, uh, so the okay. So, so it's actually a bad. It's generally considered a bad idea to do recursive locks. All right, and why? Basically, usually, the the semantics of a lock is that when you acquire a lock, uh, you know, at the point when you acquire the lock and you just enter the critical section, you can pretty much assume that this that the state is in a, is a there's a consistent state of the system. All right. So, the idea is that if you have been able to acquire the lock anybody else who has released the lock has left this con, uh, has left left the state the shared state in a consistent consistent state right or has left the left the memory in a consistent state right that is basically that is basically how that is basically been our invariant right that if I am able to acquire the lock I can assume that at the first instruction of my uh, critical section the system is in a consistent state. And the other invariant I usually maintain is that just before I release the lock, I have ensured that the system is again in consistent state, right? And so then I release the lock so that the other person who requires it will also see the system in a consistent state. So generally, you know, you, the assumption is that as you have acquired, if you have acquired the lock, the system is in a consistent state, and you will maintain it in a consistent state before you release the lock, or you'll keep it in a system consistent state. But if you do recursive acquire, then you know then it is possible that you have a function foo that uh, you know says let us say I am going to say recursive requires r acquire l does something makes it makes it inconsistent right makes the state inconsistent has not released the log right yet. So, he is going to say r release here somewhere here, but he calls bar here right and bar internally is going to say r acquire and he is going to start doing something, but he is going to assume you know assuming that these code has been written you know in mod or modular fashion in a different file or different program or whatever he is going to probably assume that it is in consistent state or assume consistency, but because you know you are using recursive locks you will you know you will violate that assumption and, and this bug will be much harder to find. So, in fact you know using recursive lock you have made it easy for your program to have bugs right that have not been that cannot be found. On the other hand if you did not use recursive lock you know the first call to bar would have told you oh there is a bug in your program right because it, there would have been a deadlock right there right. So, in general you know a programmer wants to keep his thinking simple and consistent with this idea that when you get a lock things are consistent when you release a lock things are consistent. And, uh, and if, if the programmer is indeed doing that then recursive acquire is a bad idea ok. 
all right okay then there is another uh, another variation of locks called tri locks okay so what are tri locks instead of uh, so the it's the same thing let's say um, instead the so 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 the idea is that acquire um, l has a return value now int right which basically says and you know the release is just void and the acquire basically says success or failure right so in our in our regular lock an acquire basically always succeeds or it waits in the case of a try lock you try to get the lock if you didn't get it you just return a minus 1 or a, you know a failure value right and when you f and so it's it's up to the caller to do whatever he likes of course you know you can implement a regular lock using a try lock very easy you can just sort of put the try lock in a loop and you get a get a regular lock it may not be the most efficient way to do a regular lock right but but the advantage of a try lock is it gives some flexibility to the caller he may want to say oh let's try to acquire this lock if i don't get it oh then i have something else to do let's do that first right and then retry it so so it gives him that flexibility on the other hand and the previous lock and acquire basically is committing that i'm definitely going to I'm, I'm i'm going to either do that or wait basically right so try lock gives you some flexibility into uh, you know whether you want to uh, whether you whether you want to wait or whether you want to uh, do something else okay all right okay so let's uh, let me now uh, discuss a real example so um, i hope you all know that the banking example that i took earlier was a very very hypothetical example uh, for many reasons firstly you know bank accounts are not maintained in memory secondly you usually don't write code in such a way where you're going to do a global sum operation on all the accounts you would want to do some kind of more distributed and uh, segmented way of calculating sum and so that there's more scalability in your system or you know whether you want to calculate sum at all you can just you know update the sum as the transfer is going on or something like that in any case it was just a, uh, an idea a way of telling you you know what the problems of fine grained locking are let's take a more real real example of a web server right so what is a web server a web server is let's say you know this running on this machine which has a disk and it has a network and uh, and a client sends an http request and receives a reply http response and tip, i mean uh, let's uh, let's take the simple case where the http request is a url and the reply are the contents of that url which is an html page let's say right so how is a web server like this implemented well uh, uh, well let's say you know at a very high level the web server is probably running a loop like this while one so while true you no know, it's an infinite loop read message from incoming network queue okay uh let's say url is equal to parse message all right uh, read uh, url file so whatever is the url you know you can parse it to get a file so let's say read the url file from disk right and then write so you get the url file from disk you get the contents of the file and then you write those contents so write uh, as a reply so you write the reply to outgoing network queue okay 
So what am I assuming here? I'm basically assuming that um, there is a network queue, right? Uh, there's somebody who is filling up this network queue. So there are packets being received on the wire, and those pa those packets are getting stuffed into this network queue, incoming network queue. There's this server that's running that's picking up packets from this incoming network queue, processing them in this way, and then there is an outgoing network queue. Which you just and the server is putting things into the outgoing network queue, and there's somebody who's picking things up from the ne outgoing network queue and putting them on wire. Right? So let's see what is the performance of this web server. All right? So basically, what will happen is let's say if there are multiple clients in this, uh, let's say there are, you know, there are multiple clients that are accessing this web server, their uh, requests will get queued in the incoming queue. And uh, you know, depending on how many clients there are, what is the concurrency level of clients, the, the queue will keep filling up. And the server will uh, pick up one request and uh, start serving it. So you know, the maximum number of clients that it can serve in a second is depends on how, how much time it takes to execute this code, right? And how much time does it take to execute this code? By far, the most expensive operation in this is this. Reading the URL from disk is by far the most expensive operation. These operations are likely to finish in uh, you know, hundreds of nanoseconds to maybe microseconds or something. But this operation, a URL from disk, is an operation that takes milliseconds to complete. Right? Uh, why does a disk take so much time while the other things are so much, so much faster? Uh, have we discussed this before? Uh, no, OK. So, so let's say there is a, so typically today's modern CPU runs at one to you know let's say three gigahertz, right, or roughly one to two nanoseconds per instruction. Okay, so one to two nanoseconds per instruction. Uh, if the instruction was a memory access and the memory access was a cache hit, then also you know typical uh, execution times are one to three nanoseconds. So cache hit including cache hit. If it's a cache miss, then you know, let me put approximately and roughly 100 nanoseconds for a cache miss or let's say main memory access. Right? These are all electronic op operations. These are just uh, you know, semiconductors uh, exchanging ele electrons to basically access uh, either cache or memory or things like that. The only reason memory is sort of more costly is because you have to travel a longer distance. You have to go over the bus. There's some bus contention that you have to worry about. And then you get to the memory. And then, uh, you know, but it's all electrons traveling. And so it's very fast, right? On the other hand, uh, you know, a disk access or a magnetic disk, which, uh, which has persistence, is a mechanical device, right? So a, uh, a disk, actually, um, if you look at a disk, then it's a mechanical device. Uh, so it's a mechanical device with moving parts. Okay. Um, exactly what is the structure of a disk uh, and why? Uh, and so, you know, hence it's much more costly and it's on the order of, you know, five or let's say, you know, one to 10 milliseconds. So that's 10 to the power, a million times slower than an instruction access. Right? So, which means that accessing a disk operation in that time, you could actually have executed a million instructions in, um, in CPU. So we're going to discuss uh, how a disk is organized exactly and what, what determines whether what, what the access time is exactly. And then uh, what does it mean for a web server and uh, its, uh, its scalability, which means how many concurrent clients can it support? And how you can optimize it, uh, and what role does multi-threading have to play in optimizing it? All right. So we're going to look at that. Okay. Thanks.